Start today's episode with a simple psychology experiment. For the next five minutes, don't think about ice cream. Banish all thoughts of this rich, delectable indulgence in your mouth with its creamy, cold texture punctuated by crunchy toffee bits or chocolate or the tart sweetness of cherries. Okay? Good. Let's begin. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, episode 18, How to Read John Milton's Paradise Lost, books 7 to 8. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is my fifth episode on Milton's epic poem, covering books 7 to 8, in which Adam and the Archangel Raphael exchange stories. First, Raphael recounts God's creation of the universe in the familiar seven-day story from Genesis. And then Adam recounts what he remembers of his own creation and his first meeting with Eve. We thus get Adam's account of Eve's creation, the story that she briefly told in Book 4. My subject today, in other words, has nothing whatsoever to do with ice cream. Sorry, not sorry. But if you're a typical human, you haven't been able to resist thinking about it. Ice cream is like forbidden knowledge. Tell us that we can't have it, and our minds scheme and fret over ways that we can get it. So Adam claims to have none of these urges. When he asks questions about the universe, Raphael condescendingly tells him to, quote, be lowly wise and... Quote, solicit not thy thoughts with matters hid. And Adam claims to be satisfied with that, but at the end of their conversation in Book 8, Adam also tells Raphael that he's frequently visited by carnal temptations and passions for Eve. Raphael scolds him for that, too. Sexual desire and passion are one of Milton's recurring preoccupations, one that he raises compulsively, one that he can't stop thinking about. So this episode is about forbidden knowledge, about the temptations humans can't indulge, and the questions we can't ask, let alone answer. As before, my line references are to Gordon Teske's 2005 Norton Critical Edition of Milton's poem. So, let's now read the two books in sequence, as one unit, rather like the way they were published, actually, in Milton's original 1667 edition of Paradise Lost. We'll read them as an, a single exchange between Raphael and Adam after the story of the war in heaven in books 5 and 6. In addition to what I've said already about forbidden knowledge, we're going to have two additional themes that are going to recur. The first is that Raphael is going to be consistently putting Adam in his place. And I mean that both in terms of the, the place of humans in the universe, but also man's place in his relationship with woman. And then the third theme is going to be the indescribability of the story that Raphael recounts, the story of creation. He needs to make this uh, something that Adam can understand uh, through terms that Adam will grasp, but it's something that is beyond description. We've seen that before in The War in Heaven, the way that he said that everything he's going to say is metaphorical. Well, here we have less metaphorical things uh, going on, but we do certainly have a lot of difficult concepts that Raphael is trying to describe. So, let's begin with this notion of Raphael's prevailing goal in Books 7 to 8 to put Adam in his place, so to speak, to set up man, and yes, Raphael's gendered language is deliberate, man as the paragon of animals, the, quote, masterwork, the end of all yet done, that's uh, book seven, lines 505 to six, the universe's very reason for being. Man is superior to the other creatures and has dominion over them, but Raphael adds hastily that he's also, quote, endued with sanctity of reason. 
that's book 7, lines 507 to 8, and man is also capable of self-government, he needs to remember that everything is provided for him by God. This whole world that is universe and the earth and its sustaining food and the test of his reason not to eat of the forbidden tree. Here, I want to just pause for a moment to introduce this notion of a topos, T-O-P-O-S, of, that is to say, a, a literary theme, a rhetorical move, a recurring idea. The topos that recurs in Book 7-8 is the human search for knowledge, which Milton and his characters frequently refer to as a natural appetite or thirst, but also that it has to be contained or limited. One of the most, most uh, striking instances of this, obviously, is to not break God's sole commandment, to abjure the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That knowledge is expressly forbidden and is very clearly a limit to what humans are permitted to know. As Raphael says in uh, Book 7, 546 to 47, govern well thy appetite, lest sin surprise thee and her black attendant, death. And by appetite, he literally means the, the appetite for eating of the fruit, but also the figurative appetite, the desire, the search for the knowledge the fruit will permit. Limits to human appetites for knowledge apply as much to fruits with this test of Adam's self-government as to knowledge in the aggregate. Near the beginning of Book 8, lines 13 through 38, Adam asks Raphael essentially why God created such a vast and inefficient universe if it was designed just for humanity alone. Eve, by the way, asked a really similar question in Book 4. Why do the stars shine if there's no one to see them? And this is kind of the equivalent of asking if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, whether it makes a sound or not. Only in this case, both the tree and the forest are explicitly made for human benefit. The editor's note on Adam's question points out that the universe was made vast and inefficient in order to teach humans humility, which is really begging the question, by the way. It's time now for a digression. I haven't done one of these in a long time. The expression, beg the question, is really often misused. I just used it correctly. It means to leave a question unanswered, as if the question itself is begging for a response. So to beg the question, then, means to let the question go begging. In other words, to ignore the question. To beg the question does not mean to provoke the question, which is how ignorant people use it all the time. Okay, digression slash rant over. Raphael begs Adam's question, his doubt as a rational being, about why God would make such a vast universe and even whether the earth goes round the sun, which is the new controversial Copernican model, or if the sun goes round the earth, which is the old established Ptolemaic theory. And Milton calls these questions, quote, studious thoughts abstruse in book 8, line 40. Raphael's answer is summed up in three simple words, book 8, line 173, quote, be lowly wise. Don't, in other words, ask about such things. Another line is on line 167, quote, solicit not thy thoughts with matters hid. Here's the fuller version of Raphael's answer, book 8, lines 70 through 84. Whether heaven move or earth imports not, if thou reckon right, the rest from man or angel the great architect did wisely to conceal and not divulge his secrets to be scanned by them who ought rather admire. 
or if they list a try conjecture, he his fabric of the heavens hath, hath left to their disputes, perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinions wide hereafter, when they come to model heaven and calculate the stars, how they will wield the mighty frame, how build, unbuild, contrive to save appearances, how gird the sphere with centric and e eccentric scribbled or cycle and epicycle, orb in orb. So that's nice to hear that there would be a mirth in heaven at the quaint opinions of these astronomers. But it doesn't end there. It's not just the um, size, or rather the movements of the universe. It's also the size of it. Look at line 100 following. And for the heaven's wide circuit, let it speak the maker's high magnificence who build so spacious and his line stretched out so far that man may know he dwells not in his own, an edifice too large for him to fill, lodged in a small partition, and the rest ordained for uses to his lord best known. This whole notion of the universe as humility lesson for uppity humans doesn't quite fit with the 17th century scientific revolution, in which people are permitted, even encouraged, to inquire into anything they like. Nor, let it be said, does it really fit with our sense of human dignity and agency. And even Milton, I think, can't resist hinting that maybe there are other motives for the vastness and variety of this universe. That there may be, perhaps, the possibility for humans to expand into this edifice too large for him to fill. Look at the close of book seven, when the angels have this elaborate hymn of praise to God, and they mention, just in passing, that each star in the universe may indeed be, quote, a world of destined habitation. That's line 621 to 22. And it seems kind of like a throwaway line, I confess, but it suggests at least that the stars might serve another purpose than to keep us humble. They serve to tempt us toward expansions of territory and capabilities, perhaps. However, in Book 8, it doesn't really feel like any of that occurs to Adam, who seems oddly satisfied with Raphael's non-answer. Look at 182 to 94. Freed from intricacies, Adam says, taught to live the easiest way, nor with perplexing thoughts to interrupt the sweet of life from which God hath bid us dwell, far off all anxious cares, and not molest us, unless we ourselves seek them with wandering thoughts and notions vain, but apt the mind or fancy is to rove unchecked, and of her roving is no end." Till warning or till warned, or by experience taught, she learned that not to know at large of things remote from use, obscure and subtle, but to know that which before us lies in daily life is the prime wisdom. Just to invert that last sentence, the prime wisdom then is that which before us lies in daily life, what is immediately useful to us. This puts me in mind of a line from Sherlock Holmes's story, I should say by Arthur Conan Doyle, called A Study in Scarlet. Uh, Holmes, you'll remember, the consulting detective, has an extraordinary amount of knowledge only about the world of that, that, that really matters to him, the world that helps him to solve crimes. For instance, he can tell the difference between the ash of an Egyptian cigar uh, rather than a Cuban cigar, for example. Uh, and at one point, Dr. Watson, John Watson, says about Holmes that Holmes didn't even know about the Copernican theory that the Earth went round the sun. What the deuce is it to me, Holmes interrupted impatiently. You say that we go round the sun. If we went round the moon, it would not make a penny worth of difference to me or to my work. And that is not unlike what Adam says here. That which lies before us is the prime wisdom. As I said earlier, Adam is satisfied with Raphael's non-answer. In fact, Adam loves anything that Raphael has to say to him. Look at uh, further down that page, lines 2, 11 through 16. He says, Sweeter thy discourse is to my ear than fruits of palm tree, pleasantest to thirst and hunger, both from labor at the hour of sweet repast. 
They, that is, the fruits of palm tree, satiate and soon fill, though pleasant, but thy words with divine, sorry, with grace divine imbued, bring to their sweetness no satiety. He is, in other words, never satisfied with what Raphael has to say, despite what I said earlier about just accepting what Raphael says. He just wants more and more. I, I, I think to hear of uh, Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, in which Ina Barbas is speaking of Cleopatra's beauty and says, quote, other women cloy the appetites they feed, but she makes hungry where most she satisfies. Regular listeners to this podcast know that in books five and six, Raphael describes the war in heaven. And in book seven, there's consequently a shift of topic from heavenly to, well, more earthly domains. The reason that that's important is because Milton, at the beginning, invokes this muse named Urania. She is, in fact, the only named muse in all of Paradise Lost. There were in classical theory, the there were nine separate muses. Each of them had a different domain of human activity. For example, Cleo was the muse of history. Uh, Calliope was the muse of epic poetry, etc. Urania, whose name means of the sky, is was the muse of astronomy and religious poetry, which are both really prime subjects for Book 7. Look at lines 12 through 16, when Milton describes how he has moved from heavenly to more earthly subjects. Up led by thee into the heaven of heavens, I have presumed an earthly guest, and drawn imperial air, thy tempering, with like safety guided down, return me to my native element. Adam repeats this, by the way speaking to Raphael in line 80, saying, But since thou hast vouchsafed gently for our instruction to impart things above earthly thought, which yet concerned our knowing, as to highest wisdom seemed, deign to descend now lower and relate what may no less, perhaps, avail us known. That is, he wants to know about things that are nearer to hand. Look at line 61, uh, led on, yet sinless with desire to know what nearer might concern him, that's Adam, how this world of heaven and earth conspicuous first began, when and whereof created, for what cause, what within Eden or without was done before his memory. Much as he does in Book 5, when he responds to Adam's request, Raphael first says that he talks about how this is a very difficult thing to describe, Look at line 112 to 14, when Raphael says, To recount almighty works, what words or tongue of seraph can suffice, or heart of man suffice to comprehend? And it is not untrue. There are some things that are very difficult for us humans to understand. For example, line 176 following, uh, in which Raphael says, Immediate are the acts of God, more swift than time or motion, but to human ears cannot with, without process of speech be told, so told as earthly notion can receive. That is to say, it's not like when God says things, as he's about to, like, let there be light, then there's a pause and there is light, or that God even has to utter the words, that the, that that way of describing it, this that through that quote process of speech, is only so that we, earthly hearers, can understand what God has done. There are, of course, limits to what humans may know, and I use may purposefully, not just can, but may. God has given a commission to Raphael to impart knowledge that humans are permitted by God to have. Look at lines 118 following. Such commission from above I have received to answer thy desire of knowledge within bounds. Beyond, abstain to ask, nor let thine own inventions hope things not revealed which the invisible king only omniscient hath suppressed in night to none communicable in earth or 
heaven. Enough is left besides to search and know. But knowledge is as food, and needs no less her temperance over appetite to know in measure what the mind may well contain. This topos of the search for knowledge as an appetite for knowledge as a food is going to recur all the way through books 7 and 8, and others, of course. Look, for instance, at line 68 of book 7, when Adam is described as having new thirst, as he will in book 8, line 8, describe, quote, the thirst I had of knowledge. It can be really difficult to visualize the things that Milton describes in the seven-day sequence of God's creation of the universe. On his Sabbath day, by the way, after he creates the universe, the angels welcome God back into heaven with a hymn. This is book 7, lines 603 to 604, and it begins, What thought can measure thee, or tongue relate thee? So, as your humble Raphael-like interpreter, gentle listener, I will now do my best to describe to you things that are beyond the reach of human comprehension. For example, take the Trinity. We know that there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Ghost. So, in the creation of the universe, those three each have discrete purposes and functions. God, for example, sends the Son as his instrument, and then he uses the Spirit as his vital energy. First, the Son uses God's golden compasses to circumscribe the world, which is to say the universe, Uh, Look at lines 224 following. He took the golden compasses prepared in God's eternal store, his storeroom, to circumscribe this universe and all created things. One foot he centered, and the other turned round through the vast profundity obscure, and said, Thus far extend, thus far thy bounds, this be thy just circumference, O world. He then uses, as I said, the spirit to infuse vital energy into this world. This is line 233, following. Darkness profound covered the abyss, but on the watery calm his brooding wings the spirit of God outspread, and vital virtue infused, and vital warmth throughout the fluid mass. Really, really attentive readers might remember from the very opening lines of Book 1 of Paradise Lost. This is quite similar to what Milton says, line 19 following in Book 1. Thou, the Holy Ghost slash Holy Spirit, thou from the first was, wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like, satst brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. That is foreshadowing exactly this moment in book seven. Keep in mind all these images, by the way, of vital virtue and vital warmth propagating throughout this fluid mass, this watery source of, or this this watery space of, of fertility. Keep those in mind because this is going to recur again and again all the way through Milton's account of, or rather Raphael's account of creation. At first, this is very hard to us, for us to imagine, but at first, the earth is just a watery globe. It is like a, a, a water planet of seas, but without bottom, quote, self-balanced on her center, hung in line 242. And it's only on day two, lines 261 following, that God creates, quote, firmament to, quote, divide the waters from the waters. The other thing that's very difficult for us to imagine is that the light that permeates the universe at first, that God first creates, is only in a cloud. Look at lines 247 following. In a radiant cloud, for yet the sun was not. She, in a cloudy tabernacle, that is a tent, sojourned the while. It's actually not until day four that God actually creates the sun and moon and stars. 
I said to keep in mind that Milton has a certain understanding of natural fertility. He, in line 281, calls Earth, quote, the great mother, and he describes nature's propagation of plants and animals in terms that are quite reminiscent of human reproduction. You recall, again, the pregnant Earth of Book 1. Look now at lines... Uh, 276 following. The earth was formed, but in the womb, as yet of waters, embryon, immature, involved, which literally means sunk beneath, the earth again appeared not. Over all the face of earth, main ocean flowed, not idle, but with, with warm, prolific humor, softening all her globe, fermented the great mother to conceive, satiate with genial moisture. Milton has described waters and irrigation at length in Book 4, talking about Eve. I'm sorry, talking about Eden. That's a Freudian slip. Uh, similarly, Milton now sees the influence of water on life when he creates, when God creates vegetation. By the way, they require waters. This is the tender grass, the herbs, the, the clustering vine. This is all following line 315. The swelling gourd, the corny reed, the humble shrub, the, oddly enough, the bush with frizzled hair. That's the strangest one. The stately trees, the high woods, the tufts and the borders, all of them require water. Look at uh, line 333. From the earth, a dewy mist went up and watered all the ground. Those lines about irrigation, by the way, are in book four, lines 237 through 46. They are what enable paradise, paradise to be so full of vitality. But we're not done with waters. It isn't just for plant life. Look at when, um, when Milton describes uh, God's creation of the first creatures. By the way, the word creature has as its root word create. They are of the creatures of the sea and air, the reptile and fowl and so on. But there's a huge emphasis on waters. God says in 387, let the waters generate these creatures let fowl fly. And then he talks about the waters generated by their kinds in line 393, whales and birds. And, the, and then there are references to all the different bodies of water, seas and lakes and streams and waters and creek and bay and wave and sea. And all of these references recur again and again. We get a description of Leviathan, whom we've seen before, book one, line 200 to 208. This here it is in uh, book seven, line 412. There, Leviathan, hugest of living creatures on the deep, stretched like a promontory, that is a piece of land, sleeps or swims and seems a moving land, and at his gills draws in and at his trunk spouts out a sea, that is a whale, of course. And then we have Milton moving toward the shore in line 417, following when the birds appear, caves and fens and shores and fledges. They, all of these, these, um, these eggs that are hatching are by the seaside. The eagle, the stork, the, um, the crane, the nightingale, the swan, the crested cock and the other, that is the peacock, whose gay train, this is 444, adorns him colored with the florid hue of rainbows and starry eyes. We've also got a really curious moment. One of my favorite moments in all of this, I have to say, is uh, line 425 following when Milton describes the migration patterns of birds. Part loosely wing the region, that is some stay in the region where they are born or originate, part more wise in common ranged, in figure wedge their way, intelligent of seasons, and set forth their airy caravan high over seas flying and over lands, with mutual wing easing their flight. These creatures, curiously enough, spawn from the waters themselves, their eggs, look at line 419, bursting with kindly rupture. But then we get land animals that emerge from the ground. 
Look at lines 451 through 58. Let the earth bring forth soul living in her kind, says God, cattle and creeping things and beast of the earth, each in their kind. The earth obeyed, and straight, opening her fertile womb, there's that word again, teemed at a birth in numerous living creatures, perfect forms, limbed and full-grown. Out of the ground uprose, as from his lair, the wild beast where he wands in forest wild, in thicket, brake, or den, and then a bit Further on, 463, the grassy clods now calved, now half appeared the tawny lion pawing to, pawing to get free his hinder parts, then springs as broke from bounds and rampant shakes his brinded mane. Milton then moves us to what he calls the ambiguous edge of waters in 473. He's recurrently thinking about natural habitats of all these creatures, by the way, not just giving them their food and supporting their ongoing life, but giving them their life to begin with. There was a belief in this period in something called spontaneous generation that is summed up by the very memorably unpleasant line from Hamlet when he says, if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog... We have to remember that Milton lacks our understanding of microbes, of ecosystems, and other knowledge that is gained through natural philosophy. God's sixth day of creation has to be said to be one of the busiest. It's also going to result in the creation of humans. And they have quite a different creation story. Well, not quite different, but they are made of the dust, we learn on 525 following, but they require God's breath of life. God does give humans the same commandment to, quote, be fruitful and multiply, as he has given the other creatures, but with a really important difference. Humans, he says in line 510, are to, quote, govern the rest, to dominion hold over fish of the sea and fowl of the air and every living thing that moves on the earth. Later on in book eight, during Adam's version that he tells to Raphael, we're going to get a different formulation of this. Look at uh, line 338, 338 to 40. Uh, Not only these fair bounds, says God to Adam, but all the earth to thee and to thy race I give, as lords possess it, and all things that therein live, or live in sea or air, beast, fish, and fowl. Let's move now to Book 8 to look more at what happens after Adam is created. He has an extended conversation with God after his creation. And frankly, like every other conversation with God, it's a relatively trying affair. God can be a frustrating conversation partner because he knows everything you're going to say in advance. Notice, for instance, how God, first of all, has referred already to Adam's offspring as thy race. And that provokes the question, how Adam is supposed to propagate his species in solitude? Adam says to God in line 422 following, Man by number is to manifest his single imperfection, and begat like of his like, his image multiplied in unity defective, which requires collateral love and dearest amity. Moving backward to 359, Adam has already asked God, How may I adore thee, author of this universe, and all this good to man, for whose well-being so amply and with hands so liberal thou hast provided all things. But with me I see not who partakes. In solitude, what happiness? Who can enjoy alone or all enjoying? What contentment find? Notice how Adam has again raised the efficiency question. This can't all be just for me. Adam, in other words, is also going to get lonely. And God tests him with a couple of replies about the animals as his companions and about God's own solitude. But then Adam protests that he needs companions who are his equals. Well, more or less his equals. 
Then, maddeningly, we learn that God was just testing Adam this entire time. Look at 437. Thus far to try thee, Adam, I was pleased. I'm glad it pleased you. Uh, But look at 444. I, ere thou spakest, knew it not good for man to be alone, and no such company as then thou sawest intended thee, for trial only brought to see how thou couldst judge of fit and meet. What next I bring shall please thee, be assured, thy likeness, thy fit help, thy other self, thy wish exactly to thy heart's desire. And indeed that is what Eve is to Adam, his heart's desire. We get his rhapsodic description of her beauty and his susceptibility to passionate attachment to her. Look at 523 following. I must confess to find in all things else delight indeed, but such as, used or not, works in the mind no change nor vehement desire. These delicacies, I mean, of taste, sight, smell, herbs, fruits and flowers, walks, the melody of birds, but here, far otherwise, transported, I behold, transported touch. Here, passion first I felt, commotion strange, in all enjoyment cells superior and unmoved, here only weak against the charm of beauty's powerful glance. And yet, Adam also knows, or believes he knows, that she is inwardly what he calls less exact. This means less well-ordered, less complete, or at any rate less than he is or has been told he is. Look at line 540 following. Uh, For well I understand in the prime end of nature her the inferior in the mind and inward faculties which most excel In outward, also, her resembling less his image, who made both, that is, God's image, and less expressing the character of that dominion given, or other creatures. Regardless, he is, he says, susceptible to what he calls her outward show, elaborate. Continuing at 546. Yet when I approach her loveliness, so absolute she seems, and in herself complete so well to know her own, that what she wills to do or say seems wisest, virtuousest, that's quite a word, discreetest, best, all higher knowledge in her presence falls degraded. All of this language of dominion, of higher knowledge is very clearly meant to gender the knowledge that God imparts to humans. To say, as we've seen right from the very first appearance of Adam and Eve, you might remember from book four, line 295 following, they are not equal, Milton says, for contemplation he and valor formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace, he for God only, she for God in him. But now Adam is saying dangerous things about higher knowledge degrading in her presence, about possibly reason uh, being susceptible to passion, to beauty, to her influence. And this is the sort of thing that really makes Raphael Um, worried. The angel with contracted brow, line 560, that means a furrowed brow. He warns Adam in quite explicit terms. What admirest thou? What transports thee so? An outside, he says. This is line 567 following. Fair, no doubt, and worthy well thy cherishing, thy honoring, honoring, and thy love, not thy subjection. I've spoken many times in this podcast series about how we are seeing Milton's 
profound investment in the Christian notions of hierarchy, of reason over passion, of male over female. And we are now going to see it in a different version uh, when he speaks about passions. This is all, we can see exactly where all of this argument is going, where it is all headed. We know that Eve is going to be the one to eat the fruit first. We know that she is then going to convince Adam to eat the fruit Oh, did you not know that? Sorry. Well, now you do. So this is all going to be an accusation. These are all accusations that are going to be leveled at Eve. Just just you wait until book nine. Um, look at now, the, the worry that Raphael has to go on is that Adam is going to be susceptible to carnal pleasures and sexual love. Look at 579 following. If the sense of touch whereby mankind is propagated seem such dear delight beyond all other, this is Raphael speaking, think the same vouchsafe to cattle and each beast which would not be to them made common and divulged if aught therein enjoyed were worthy to subdue the soul of man or passion in him move. What higher in her society thou find'st attractive, human, rational, love still. In loving thou dost well, in passion not, wherein true love consists not. Adam, perhaps a tad embarrassed by all this conversation about carnal pleasure, talks also about Eve in everyday life, how marvelous she is with her, quote, graceful acts, this is line 600, those thousand decencies that daily flow from all her words and actions mixed with love and sweet compliance, which declare unfeigned union of mind, or in us both one soul. Adam then asks Raphael if perhaps the angels love each other the way that humans do, and Raphael turns rosy red in line 619, perhaps blushing, and replies with this description, Whatever pure thou and the body enjoyest, and pure thou wert created, we, angels, enjoy in eminence, and obstacle find none of membrane, joint or limb, exclusive bars, easier than air with air, if spirits embrace total they mix, union of pure with pure desiring, nor restrained conveyance need as flesh to mix with flesh or soul with soul. It's a compelling description, but Raphael tosses it in as a final aside and then gives Adam his final warning before he flies back up to heaven. And so, at the close of this podcast, if you are still thinking of ice cream and other appetites, go now and enjoy them in eminence. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on the amorous poetry of Andrew Marvell, including one that is appropriate for Adam, quote, a dialogue between a resolved soul and a created pleasure. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary, that's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka.